Yeah, so I'm going to talk today about the federal source code study. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, here in my personal capacity. I'm required to say this, but uh, uh, yeah, basically I'm from a large federal agency and um, I've been, uh, been implementing the federal source code policy and uh, focus on open source uh, software publication for the federal government. So for the next, like I said, for the next 35 minutes, I'll talk about uh, US government uh, federal efforts with uh, source code and then open source software. Uh, this project originally started as, um, as my PhD dissertation at Virginia Tech. And, um, and then, um, you know, I kind of repurposed some of it to make it a little less academic and uh, used it for a work project. Um, but ultimately, it's a, it's a three-year study of source code and the code.gov program. Um, and uh, yeah, a, a labor of love for me, and I, I hope you enjoy this. And um, it's also published on GitHub. I have a link at the end, and I'll, I'll uh, you know, you'll see that on the last slide as well. It's in our code.gov repo, if you're familiar with code.gov. If not, that's fine. I'll show a link at the end. Um, so let me get into it here. So a little about me uh, real quick, I won't do this too long, but yeah, like I said, I'm an open source researcher and developer. So, um, you know, mostly front end engineering these days, uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, a little bit of Python um, for some Python scripts to do some data mining and things, uh, mostly with the GitHub API. Uh, as I'm gathering metrics or, or you know, things for, for this research. Uh, 16 and a half years in the federal government in various IT roles from engineering to policy um, and everything in between. Worked in the Obama administration doing open data policy uh, back in 2013. Um, have my PhD from Virginia Tech and I'm also an army veteran uh, as well. So let's dive into the, the uh, policy real fast. So to set some context for the study, uh, it all sort of starts with the federal source code policy. So in 2016, the White House issued the federal source code policy or M1621. Uh, we have different memos that come out of OMB and, and basically it directed um, executive level agencies. So there's, there's 24 major executive agencies or, or cabinet agencies, if you will. So like State Department, Justice, uh, Transportation and, and so forth. And it basically the policy directed these agencies to do three things, uh, develop uh, an, an internal source code policy. So their own agency source code policy, um, update acquisition language to capture new custom code, whether, whether it's built by a contractor or a federal employee, and then inventory agency custom code uh, to be posted publicly on code.gov. Um, code.gov itself, um, with the policy establishes code.gov code as a program office, but also a website. And then we have an API as well that, that aggregates these, these inventory files uh, for, for placement on the site. So before um, you know, getting to the study itself, so we have the federal source code policy and um, the policy comes out and we can go to uh, GitHub. Uh, there's a lot of data on the GitHub API. So it kind of makes it easy for us to, to start there. There's a lot of code repos on GitHub. So it kind of makes sense. Um, here are some GitHub numbers. This is a, a, a table of data I pulled from November of 2018. And you can see um, the major agencies, there's 24 of them listed here. And I somewhat split them in thirds. It's kind of color coded, um, you know, eight in each, each third. And um, the idea is that the federal source code policy comes out and you can see the number of repositories of code before the policy was published, uh, which is the pre FSCP and then the number of code repositories after the code was published. Um, and so it's interesting because in some cases, um, some agencies ended up publishing more and some agencies published less. And so there was sort of this, um, you know, question of, of uh, you know, uh, how come some agencies can publish uh, open source software or software in general, um, you know, it could still be government wide reuse or some other things and some agencies can't do it. And if you think of agencies, you know, federal government agencies, so the annual IT budget for the federal government is, is uh, somewhere just south of about $80 billion. Um, this is just for IT, so hardware, software, you know, infrastructure, security, all those good things. And, um, basically about 7% of that uh, IT budget, that, that 80 billion is spent just on software itself, software purchasing, software customization, um, and all that good stuff. So, you know, the question comes to, comes to mind that if everyone had the same uh, executive policy to publish source code, uh, you know, create the inventory, do the acquisition language and, and publish source code, then how come some agencies were able to do it? You know, conceivably everyone has a budget, everyone has IT staff, um, but say, some agencies can do it better than others. And so 
with the study, you know, to examine this with the study, the idea was, well, there's got to be something sort of bigger or something else going on within the organization itself uh, that, that uh, you know, it's not an IT thing. It's not a skill thing necessarily or, or, or having people there. It's more or less something broader in the organization. And so that's where we, that's where I went with the study as well. Uh, so that actually led to some research questions. So I'll jump into that. So the study purpose was, was basically, you know, examine the federal source code policy implementation by using open source publication as one indicator for compliance. So uh, not the only ind indicator for compliance, but that was an easy one to, uh, to find uh, to see if agencies were publishing. So specifically, why do some federal agencies publish open source software and others do not? And one way to examine uh, the agency progress was to look at the organizational factors um, believed to affect OSS publication, so open source software publication. And, 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 I, and I would argue, like, like even though I was only looking at federal agencies, the things that I was looking at and, and the results potentially could, you could almost say like at any large, um, you know, any large organization, whether it's industry, you know, nonprofit or government, it's probably going to going to experience some of these same issues because uh, these organizational factors pretty much cut across industry. So it doesn't really matter. You could say, well, I'm from industry. So that's like a government thing. And it's like, well, not really because, you know, organizations are organizations and there's certain theoretical constructs that go into, uh, you know, organization makeup and how they operate. And so, um, you know, specifically I was looking at federal source code because that's, that's where I live in the federal space. And that's where the data was coming from, but really we could we could take this broader. So anyway, the um, the four factors were cultural beliefs, public engagement, structural dimensions, and uh, organization location, and whether these, uh, you know, how these affected, you know, um, agencies' abilities or or federal organization abilities to to publish open source software, hence comply with the federal source code policy. So, uh, so I'm going to dive into each one of these real quick. I won't, I won't go too, uh, too much uh, into this, but just to give you some idea of what each one means uh, or how I constructed the, you know, the con or put it together, the variable itself. So cultural beliefs support making predictions and selecting actions. Uh, beliefs are important to understanding what is enacted given particular situations. Uh, public engagement enables individuals to come together within a technical domain to ask questions and solve particular problems. Uh, typically, public engagement is you would you would be, you know, uh, having conversations, having meetings, collaborating with individuals outside of your particular uh, unit or office. Uh, structural dimensions include how organizations are socially structured, and it considers centralization, which is decision making, uh, formalization, which are rules and policies, uh, differentiation, um, which is diversity of skills for task management and completion, and then coordination or communication. So a lot, a lot of words here, but basically structural dimension uh, is comprised of decision-making, uh, rules and policies, uh, diversity of skills, and uh, coordination or communication. And then organization structure, usually um, organizations will respond to environmental disturbances is what we call it. And so what that really means is that as new technologies and as new policies are created and the organization has to implement those things, um, organizations will, um, or offices or units or, you know, what have you will respond um, in, a, in a particular way. And so, you know, going into organization theory literature, which I won't really go into, uh, basically they would say like, you know, if, if a certain um, disturbance happens in a certain way, then the, you'll, you'll get a certain sort of structuring, if you will. I, I won't go much more on that. Um, Organization location is not the physical location. Um, rather, it's the um, it's it's where the organization resides in a larger like in an organization chart, and also has to do with hierarchy, with how many layers within that chart that unit sits, and also proximity to authority. And um, and and I'll talk about the impact of of these variables as we go, or these organization factors as we go. So research design, it was a qualitative study, uh, qualitative research. Um, typically qualitative research is, is to um, uh, don't fully understand the phenomenon or the issue at hand. And so it's a way to kind of explore in some sense. Um, it allows for a certain amount of richness. So, you know, I did uh, interviews and collected artifacts, which were organizational charts and emails and anything that would tell me kind of about the, the structure of the organization and, and what was happening. Um, uh, different policy documents and things like those. And um, 
you know, you started off with a metadata analysis with the GitHub API. So, so to con to set up like a construct, like basically a conceptual framework, um, that initial chart to see where agencies were with publishing open source software. So uh, looked at that first, and then you know dove more into the you know the qualitative factors, and then use a theory. Um, it's called a grounded theory method for data analysis and theory building. So it basically, just gives me like a like a prescriptive way to collect data and then analyze it. Uh, I think that's it there. So you can see some uh, some general you know descriptive statistics here. Um, most of the units in the study were from were from non software. Uh, developing groups, um, which, which was interesting because, you know, I, I was thinking like open source software, uh, the idea or, or creating any software, the idea is that you would get, you know, all participants would be from a software development shop within a government organization. And it actually turned out that a lot of them uh, were not. And so they ended up, the other types of, you know, offices were like policy um, or they were doing something else like data science. They were building scripts, which were software related scripts, but they weren't um, actually you know, within a software office. Um, interesting, um, the second one, government, government units consume more OSS than they publish. So since World War II, um, this has sort of ebbed and flowed with technology and the resurgence in 1990s with like server and web technologies. Um, so, uh, and I think we could probably say this for industry too. So that second table where we have consuming at 52% and publishing percent at 24, it just shows that there's definitely way more consumption of open source software than there is actually publishing of it. And, and I would say that probably cuts across all industries as well. So data collection, um, you know, I collected based on the organizational factors and uh, you know, went out, did the interviews, uh, did the artifact uh, analysis, collection and analysis. And um, for cultural beliefs, um, the categories were developed and it, and it pretty much split in the way that individuals believed or thought about uh, open source software and software publication uh, among like cautionary and advantageous. So it was almost like a dichotomous variable, if you will. But in reality, uh, in some cases, people that did have cautionary beliefs also held advantageous beliefs. So that was sort of an interesting find. So even though they, um, and I'll get to findings later, but even though they uh, uh, were, were suspicious of it, right? Like, oh, it's not part of my job. It doesn't align to my scope. Um, I don't want to change. We're already coding a certain way. Why should we code a different way? Um, it's risky, those sorts of things. But then they would say, well, but I guess it could be beneficial, you know, for some people, um, you know, depending on what they're working on and if that's part of their, you know, the way they develop and publish software, or if that's part of their community, you know, if they're doing a community or, you know, their customer wants it or something like that. Um, so basically cautionary participants um, in this category were reticent with new technology and policy. And then advantageous from a definitional standpoint, participants in this category held beliefs based on perceived and realized outcomes. So oftentimes for advantageous, if they, uh, you know, units or offices that worked with software, if they, had experience with open source software. So they were using something like a GitHub with open source software and they were doing like CI, CD and automated testing. Others, they found that, well, one that just um, solidified their beliefs with using you know, open source software, or those sorts of tools, but also others within their agency or other offices around that would come to them and say, hey, what are you doing? That's pretty cool. Can we try that too? And then they would get more people involved. And then it was, it was you know, this, the beliefs would start to change, if you will. So if people can experience it, uh, it often helps to, to change um, beliefs, you know, and expectations as well. Uh, public engagement. Um, basically, this, uh, this is, I talked about this a little bit, but um, the idea behind public engagement is that you're working with individuals outside of your office or outside of your agency and potentially with the public. And so, um, you know, organizations approach uh, collaboration um, basically with those outside the boundaries of the organization, um, public engagement came down to, um, you know, bi-directional communication, um, events, electronic tools and all that stuff. And so a lot of times the participants would say, I'd say, you know, why do you, why do you do this? And so, you know, tell me who you talk with outside of your office and why do you do this and all this good stuff. And they would say, oh, you know, it, um, you know, we would create a forum, we'd le leverage others. In some cases it would help to get uh, developers outside of their own office to come and help and do development and all that good stuff. So, um, you know, there are multiple reasons there. And sometimes they would do like team augmentation and even product um, augmentation, which helped 
uh, to then push them to publish uh, more software as well. Structural dimensions, I talked about this a, a minute ago. Um, there, there are numerous factors to organization structural dimensions. These are socially constructed. So how the organization comes about, you know, to make decisions and understand capabilities and, you know, um, have individuals with diverse skills and what have you. And so uh, structural dimensions um, is based on a literature called the technology structure literature, which I won't really go into, but it basically pertains to how units organize based on techno technical uncertainty or complexity. And so, um, you know, I focused on these four things and, and sort of offered the questions and, and responses and all that good stuff around those structural dimensions. Um, organization location was concerned where the unit was in the larger uh, organization proximity to authority. So I talked about this, uh, you know, a couple seconds ago as well. So now the, now the results. Um, so, and, and this might be, some of this may, I, I always think like, I'm not really surprised in some sense, but at least now we kind of know with some real data, uh, you know, how we've, how we've come to understand, you know, or, or, or how we come to, to realize what's happening now or something. And uh, so the idea with cultural beliefs is that you can see as agencies, you know, uh, publish more frequently um, for open source software, they tend to have more advantageous beliefs. So I think that goes back to like, you know, they have experiences, they've, they've, they've lived it in some sense, right? And so now they're they um, potentially will will publish more, but it just it just solidifies that hey, this is potentially a good thing. Um, it shows competency, and uh, you know it's beneficial for others and all that good stuff. In a lot of cases, individuals that worked in the in in well, they all did, but of all the people, uh, a lot of them would say, you know, part of it, it it's our job, right? Like we we should be uh, publishing more software because it's a public good and it's taxpayer dollars and they paid for it. So they should have it, right? It's the people's code. And uh, so there, so a lot of beliefs that were advantageous tended to, um, you know, fall in, fall in those, you know, aspects, if you will. Um, ultimately, uh, sometimes having advantageous beliefs were not enough to publish. So this was pretty interesting. So that was a, that sort of dichotomous variable where uh, there were, you know, quite a few people that had cautionary beliefs and, even if they thought it would be a good thing to publish, um, other organizational sort of constraints wouldn't let them do it. Um, so, you know, you can think all day like, oh, it'd be the greatest thing, uh, but we're not allowed because we don't have a policy or it's not within our scope or, you know, it's too risky, you know, putting code out there and things like that. So even just having the belief wasn't always enough to, uh, to get you or, or allow you to, to publish code. So for public engagement, um, most participants uh, coded in this category, although, although those publishing more open source software tended to be more in varied uh, public engagement. So probably not that surprising here either, the way that um, you know, a lot of times uh, we get out of our own environments, we get out of our silos and we uh, tend, to, tend to be able to, to you know, we learn from others, right? We go to conferences like these and we, we uh, you know, have small work groups or, you know, coding groups or hackathons or, or what have you. And so it kind of makes sense that as you're exposed to more things, your belief structure changes, um, you know, so then as you do more public engagement and you work with others, you see what they're doing, then you, you know, you learn from that and then you're, you know, you're more willing to do things or, or have an ability or capability to, you know, to go out and do things. So um, it wasn't purely that it was just more public engagement. It also had to do with like a varied approach and tools. So the tools had to be in place and these were more like collaboration tools. Um, you know, a lot of times it, it came down to, um, can you actually communicate with individuals outside of your own organization, um, outside of your silo? So that could be as simple as like, you know, having an account on GitHub and, and uh, you know, communicating through issues and pull requests. Um, or it could be as, um, you know, I wouldn't say complex, but, or it could be something where it's a little more rich, where you, you know, have, um, you know, Slack and you're in different groups and you can talk across organizational boundaries. Um, that helps a lot too. So um, a, a decent amount of units actually said that they were doing public engagement, but in reality, they, they tended to do, it was more like unit testing and things and they were just talking to individuals outside the unit. So there is, there's definitely like a nuance of like how far do you go sort of metaphorically um, outside your unit to uh, engage with others and, and learn from them as well. Um, 
the over, overlapping variables. So this kind of goes back to um, to the advantageous beliefs that that even if you have advantageous beliefs, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you're gonna you're gonna be able to publish any more software or publish at all, really. And so um, there were some other factors that were sort of falling into place here that it's not just good enough to have advantageous beliefs, but it's also that you have other things in place. So it's you know there was some connection, and I can't you know being qualitative research, I can't speak to the the strength of connection um, or the strength of correlation or correlation at all um, with any of these uh, sort of variables. But the idea is that uh, looking at the data and trying to quantify it in some way, uh, the four variables, the advantageous cultural beliefs, the more and varied public engagement, diverse skills and participatory decision-making all seem to sort of overlap in some way. Um, so they were complementary of each other. And this would actually be an interesting place to, to do further research. Um, I probably won't do it, but if you do it, let me know so I can so I can uh, see what you come up with. But yeah, th uh, there's definitely more research to be done here. Um, the structural dimensions. So one of the interesting finds here, actually, there were there were two of them in this area, and um, yeah, there were two of them in this area, and one of them had to do with uh, uh, formalization. So formalization is rules and policies, you know, standard operating procedures, uh, sort of any sort of uh, boundary or constraint within the organization. Um, some, sometimes, and this is the interesting find, sometimes they actually allow you to, uh, to do things that maybe you can't normally do. So, um, so what I found with formalization that was different than what the literature was saying was basically that um, units would publish software uh, if, if they had a policy in place and units that didn't publish software wouldn't because they didn't have a policy in place. And so what I think is interesting about this is that the units that were publishing, when I talked to them, they would say, oh, well, you know, we have a policy and, um, you know, that allows us. So the first thing we did is when the federal source code policy came out, as we said, okay, well, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to this? So they went and wrote a policy first. And so I was thinking all along, like, oh, it's going to be the wild west. Like, you know, people are just publishing whatever they want, whether they have permission or not, um, you know, they can just go out and do it. And, uh, and the reality was, it was actually the opposite. Um, they formalized first, and then they said, okay, well, now we can publish, um, you know, now we can publish software because we have permission because the policy gives us permission. So um, that that part might be somewhat um, governmental. Um, I think it's interesting. We definitely don't move without policy. Um, and part of it is that it provides sort of the guardrails of, of what we can and can't do. And, and we look for that, um, you know, it sounds like in most cases, uh, you know, for doing for doing any activity and especially publishing code. So uh, that was an interesting find. The other part was, um, this has come up recently in sort of popular, or maybe popular, just media in general around the DC area, um, around you know the executive branch. And there's other groups who do software development that are government folks. Um, there's group, there's offices like 18F and US Digital Service and, and what have you. And so there's always this sort of in the press about like, should the government be uh, you know, building software when, you know, contractors are out there who also build software, shouldn't the government just be contracting and not, you know, not, uh, you know, not building it themselves, they should just be, you know, buying contractors and then managing the process and what have you. And so there's always sort of this argument back and forth of why do we have these special groups and what have you. And actually what the, what the research showed is that there's definitely, um, without a good uh, grasp of the skill of, you know, working with software, working with code and being able to get it into a certain, you know, condition to publish it, if you will, or understanding what open source is and how to actually publish or code in a certain way, um, we're going to be limited um, as an organization or as a government to, to implement policy, implement any really, it, you could almost just generalize in some sense that, you know, uh, we're going to have a hard time implementing pol technology policy and technology itself because we have a skills gap um, you know, across the government. And, and I'll explain that a little bit further. There, there's this notion of the hollow state. And if you um, follow the, in public administration literature, there's a, there's a group of, of researchers that basically say that the government has contracted out so much that they've become, um, you know, they basically in some sense have lost control, if you will. And so uh, it's hard to manage, it's hard to manage um, and control 
you know, individuals or products or whatever in delivering something if, if you don't truly understand what that, what that product is and, and what should be delivered and all that good stuff. And so the hollow state is basically that, you know, the skill, there's a, there's a big skills gap and it's, it, it, you know, it, it's in government. And until we can get more technical skills, you know, back in government, we're going to have a hard time with any sort of tech policy or any sort of technology in and of itself. So that was, a, that was a pretty um, interesting find. It's probably not that, probably not really like the most exciting or, or new information, if you will, but it's definitely a, um, you know, something that we need to consider as a government, um, you know, uh, as we go forward and, and work with technology. So organization location, this didn't really have as much to do with, with publication. Um, you know, uh, it was a pretty even split among all these, but it, anecdotally, it seemed like uh, individuals that were closer. So the, the federal source code policy is aimed at the CIO, and then the CIO is responsible to manage the internal policy for, for an agency. So, you know, State Department or Justice or whatever. And so um, what was interesting here is that individuals and, and units um, that were creating software, if they were having regular conversations or, or, you know, in touch with the CIO shop, but then also in touch with sort of an organizational customer or someone at the boundary of the organization, they tended to um, publish more software more frequently. So um, there was a, a need to make it public. There was a need to work with an external customer. And then there was also like a general understanding of what the policy was and how to implement it. Um, and that was somewhat anecdotal. The, the numbers almost went uh, pretty even. Um, you know, in this category. So it wasn't, it wasn't as, uh, you know, as strong of a factor. The other, the other part of this is usually proximity um, to authority. Uh, and uh, so if your office was relatively flat, or if the office was relatively flat, and less reporting structures, and ultimately, there was usually someone, um, usually in an executive position, but not always, but someone that could, could grasp the reason to do more open source software. Um, and publish more frequently, then the, that, that unit, that office tended to do it more frequently. So real fast here, I have about, uh, I have about uh, maybe about two minutes or so, and then we'll go into questions, really a little bit longer, but we'll go into questions. Um, let me go into the theory. So the idea of grounded theory is that you do a prescriptive data collection and analysis piece, and then you can come up with some generalizations about uh, you know, at least what the data is telling you for your study. So the idea is that theory is descriptive, it's explanatory, it enhances understanding of the world and allows for predictions of what might happen in the future. And so now, now after taking all the data, looking at it, uh, you know, doing the analysis and the, and the findings, we kind of get to this sort of theory of, you know, policy implementation. So this idea of this like descriptive and explanatory, uh, you know, effort or focus of you know, policy implementation for, for um, open source. And I've, I've pretty much said most of this, I haven't said it necessarily in the same terms, but you know, advantageous cultural beliefs help. Uh, I didn't say anything about non-monolithic, but basically working within a unit that has complementary uh, beliefs as maybe a parent organization, but also something, uh, you know, potentially slightly different um, is okay. Uh, public engagement more and varied through bi-directional communication. So working with individuals outside of the organization, um, hackathons, uh, you know, just work groups and things like that. Electronic tools definitely help. Less centralization, more formalization. So definitely rules, the policy was the big thing and the skills were a big thing in structural dimensions. And then organization was uh, uh, proximity to authority and then having less hierarchical layers. So if you have this sort of makeup or this, you know, gathering the data, uh, doing the analysis, putting this together, this theory, like you could almost say, like, I wonder, you know, the next thing you would do would be like, can I test this on something else? Can I test it on education policy? Can I test it on transportation policy? Can I, you know, any sort of tech policy? Can I test this and see if it would actually hold true in, uh, you know, in those other cases as well. Um, for, the, for this data and this study, uh, this is somewhat the theory of what was happening. And so then you say, okay, well, what can we do with all that? So there are implications. So as, as public administrators, and, and really like I, you know, I talked earlier about um, this could apply to industry as well. So you could say like as engineering managers, as you know, uh, directors of you know, various groups that deal with technology and, and you know, it may not be policy per se, but technology you know, requirements or rules within your own organizations. These, I, I would imagine that these implications would, would be pretty relevant to you as well. So um, units require policy to implement technology. 
that's pretty straightforward. Even with policy, it's not always clear what can what units can do, what's required, what's allowed. We have a lot of policy in government, a lot of rules in government, basically, and so there's sometimes competing interests um, within the units about what can and can't be done. So it's, mis it's almost like there's too much policy in some sense. Um, public administrators should nurture advent advantageous cultural beliefs. So the idea is that um, you know we can do more uh, if we experience certain things. Uh, public administrators should encourage more and varied public engagement. And then um, organization theory, organizations you know, should consider how they structure. And some of that has to do with what's happening in, in the environment as well. And then also how, how units reside in the larger uh, structure in and of itself. Not always as easy to, to, to deal with that, especially in very large organizations. And that is actually it for me. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. And so if you wanna put them in the chat or the q and A, I'd be happy to Happy to uh, to answer, and and I'll read them out loud, and then I can I can you know talk about them as well. So let's see. I'm looking at the chat right now. Um, so one. Uh, so this is Sean Morrison. I was trying to figure out. I was doing some testing earlier, and so I was trying to figure out where it was. So uh, Sean Morrison um, asks, uh, how can we bring DOD into compliance? So <laughs> that's, a, that's a broad question um, and I appreciate it. Um, so DOD is um, interesting. DOD is a very lar large organization. Um, parts of DOD do really well. Um, and, I, and I don't wanna speak poorly of, of anyone in particular. Uh, the, the best organization or, or some of the best, actually there's a couple, um, uh, the NSA, which may say, well, it's not really like DOD proper, but if you think of the Pentagon, but um, NSA, National Security Agency, um, has uh, a lot of open source projects and they, um, a couple of them come to mind, Walk Off, which is an automation flow processing kind of solution, uh, Gidra, which is like a reverse engineering solution. That one just came out like a year or two ago. Uh, but anyway, NSA has a website with all their open source projects and uh, you can you can find that. I mean, just run a Google search, you'll find those. Um, Air Force is doing some really good stuff in in various pockets, um, various bases, I should say. I know up by Boston, there's some good stuff going on uh, there as well. So it's just it just kind of depends. And interesting, DoD in and of itself um, was one of the first to even discuss open source and federal source code more generally. With um, they, if you look up like DoD Q and A. Um, there's an old document, I want to say it's from the 80s. So they, they were talking about this a long time ago. Um, they also had the Defense Digital Service, which was out of the Pentagon under the Office of Secretary of Defense. And, um, and uh, they, they did some really good work. I, don't, I, I think that um, some folks have, have since left there, just their time was up. They were on term appointments, which means they had two to four years to do some things. And, and then they have a job no longer in government. Um, so they... Um, you know they're, they've gone on to do other things, and um, you know I'm I'm guessing at some point they'll they'll restaff uh, that office or, or do something else with it. But they were doing some really good stuff. They did. Um, we had code.gov. They had uh, code.mil. So there were some some projects over there that the DoD was putting out. Um, Madeline Preston says, "I love the shaming section on the website." Yes, that is one of the, the one of the ways to get attention um, for agencies that aren't. Uh, doing what they should be doing. Um, that's a typical government. Um, oh, I shouldn't say it that way. I'm generalizing, but that's one way to get agencies to to uh, to focus on a particular policy is to is to just make it public, and then hopefully there's some some pressure, if you will, from from inside in the man the management itself, but also the public, nonprofit organizations, and things like that that want more information out for the public um, with the people's code. So Sean had another one. Is someone that's been working on in DOD on OSS for 20 years now. Oh, that's awesome, Sean. Uh, one consistent cultural issue is broad devaluation and recurring FUD at the branch chief level. I'm not sure what FUD is. And when faced with numbers showing robust acquisition cost savings, here's a, what can be done about cultural apathy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, definitely open source software, publishing it is definitely a bottom up thing. Um, I also think as, what I've seen is that as larger 
organizations, commercial organizations have been buying other organizations. So uh, think, you know, Microsoft, GitHub, Red Hat, IBM, uh, you know, I think it just shows the value of open source. And those are just two examples. There's probably many more at a smaller, you know, scale level, but um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, part of it is that affecting beliefs is, is trying to show it through, you're trying to show it through or, or experience it or get people to experience it. So you have to actually practice it in some way. And so it's, it's small wins and then uh, proof over time, you know. Um, George Link, what other metrics or things do you look at that didn't make it into the final report? Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, I went into the organizational factors. I was doing a PhD, it kind of made sense, um, you know, uh, getting into the theoretical and the literature. But in reality, a lot of times, um, and, and, you know, often on, um, you know, management asks, you know, what's the value of this program? Are we making our money on it? You know, because we pay contractors, there's a couple of us, we're not very big, uh, there's four of us now. But, um, you know, the question is always, what's the value? And, and part of the struggle, so we do show things like engagement metrics where like, you know, we can't, you know, we have the number of repositories have gone up to 7,000 from 50. Um, and that's just what we have on the site. There's, there's probably more out there. Um, if you look at GitHub metrics through the API, you can see like, you know, number of repos goes up about, it's about 200 a month um, are, are added to our site, but then also, you know, I think it's like 80% of those are on GitHub itself. And I'm not just endorsing GitHub, that just happens to be where they are. Um, and then out of that, you have pull requests that are going up and you have, you know, I mean, it kind of makes sense. You have more repos, you have more pull requests, more issues, right? So there's definitely more engagement over time. Um, but from an organizational factor standpoint, I just, I just looked at the ones that I had and that was really just based on the literature uh, generally with organization theory, and then um, also just with what we were kind of seeing uh, being on the project for a couple of years. Uh, William Savino, Census is just now finalizing our open source policy. Still need to work on implementation. Should we look at the open source program office model, a charter, any advice? Um, I'm not as familiar with the open source program office model. Um, if there's something specific there, I mean, I get the idea of having a program office to, to manage that. I haven't seen that yet in government. Um, it's usually an individual in a policy uh, shop within a CIO office that's responsible, um, which is a pretty big task for, you know, some agencies have billion dollar budgets and which means they're just huge and you're probably not going to be able to, to oversee everything as like a PMO might. Um, but yeah, the, definitely the, the best way is just get a policy, just get something published because without that, you're not gonna be able to do much of anything. So that's, that's definitely number one. And then after that, um, probably start thinking about guidance and instruction, like how do you open source? Um, and, and not so much like how do you write code to open source, but some of the cultural things, like how do you get through legal? What kind of licensing do you do? Uh, all that good stuff. Uh, Sean, Sean again, uh, thanks so much. Appreciate it, Sean. Uh, FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, I know when I first talked about the source code policy in my agency, um, you know, the security folks were the ones that were the most, uh, you know, vocal. And so as soon as security comes in, then everything else kind of stops. And the reality is that if open source is done right or the source code is done right, um, it's actually more secure in the long run. Um, you know, you have the dependency chat. I mean, we have like on our current platform of 15 repositories, we have, oh, I don't know, we have like five to eight different testing suites. And so we have three alone just for dependency checkers, um, you know, SNCC, uh, GitHub Dependabot, NPM, and, uh, and then we have all sorts of other things. But yeah, I mean, we have so many tests and so much validation for security. Not that things couldn't slip through, but it just makes it that much harder. Um, Let's see, I think that's pretty much it. I still have a couple minutes. Um, look at the OSPO++ working group for people who are discussing how to implement in the open source programs office. So that's, thanks, I appreciate that, George. George Link put that on there. And then William followed on. Hold on, there's one q and oh. Since this is now, oh, same thing. Okay, that was William. Cool. Any other, any other questions? We still have a couple minutes. I 
think we're it's quiet now. I might get five minutes back. <laughs> feel free to feel free to reach out. Um, I do have our government email address. I'm happy to give that out later as well. Uh, but hit me on the socials and uh, and we can go from there. And then oh, and the study is live. It's the GitHub link. Um, oh, you can't see it, but it's in the CodeGov repository. We have 15 repositories, but there's one repository that rules them all, and it's called Go uh, Code hyphen gov and so it's github uh, slash gsa slash code hyphen gov and within that there's docs and the studies in there as well so you're welcome to look at that we've also um we have a medium account for code code.gov and uh i've taken smaller sections of the study and kind of re rewritten some of them to make them a little more digestible as well so if you want to look at that we have seven of nine articles on medium right now so if you just look up code.gov on medium uh, and the federal source code study, you'll see some of those articles. Uh, Sean Morrison, the last question, uh, maybe, do you know if there's anything in the future for code.gov dashboard? We actually want to change the dashboard. The metrics on there are kind of stale and uh, we want to be able to, to, um, to basically calculate the metrics in some sense. So based on the inventories that we, we harvest, we want to be able to say like, okay, of the data we do have, are we getting what we are supposed to be getting? And I could get into that, you know, much more detail later, but uh, yeah, we do, we are looking at that all the time to, um, to get better data.